Hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk about the experiential metafunction of language. Uh, this is a tool that's useful for when you want to talk about how language can be used to describe different experiences that we have, uh, and especially for distinguishing between different uses, uh, different meanings of the same words as sometimes happens, like you'll see in these three examples here, right? If you look at felt in these three sentences, now felt is the same here in many ways, right? It's spelt the same, it's pronounced the same way. Uh, you would describe it grammatically the same way. It's a verb uh, in, a, in a declarative mood clause. It's a uh, past tense, past simple, right? So, okay, it's the same in many ways, but if you look at it, you know, it means something different there, right? Uh, and if you wanted to describe the difference in meaning in those three examples, well, you could just use your own words, right? You could say that felt the wood uh, means like touched the wood, right? And felt that I was at a crossroads has a, it means something like thinking, right? Thinking that you're at a crossroads in your life. Where, and felt tired has to do with a physical sensation, right? So if number one is actually actively doing something and number two is a mental doing something and number three was feeling tired, you're not really doing anything, right? But something you're describing experience, but where nothing's actually happening, right? Uh, that, that number three, there's a good example of how, you know, probably in school, your teacher said something like verbs are doing words, which is often true. Uh, and for example, in number one, you're definitely doing something, feeling the wood. But number two, are you doing something? Well, you're doing something in your head, right? Or, or emotional, mental, emotional doing of something. Number three, you're not really doing anything, right? And yet it's certainly a verb. So how can we talk about these in a precise way? That's what the tools available to us uh, as described in the experiential metafunction do, right? Now, We'll come back to the actual terms in a minute, but I'll just show you them here to introduce them, right? Uh, felt, in the first case, would be described as being a material process, right? The word used here is process, and I'll come to that in a minute, but felt, you're doing something material, right? Touching, active uh, thing is happening. Uh, with felt, in the second case, it's a mental process, right? It's happening in your head. Felt in number three is called a relational process. It The felt there, as I said earlier, doesn't really do anything, right? There's no action happening. All it does is relate. You know, you're related to your family, right? You're connected to them. Felt in number three just relates number one. I'm uh, sorry, relates I and tired, right? I tired. I mean, you hardly even need relational processes, right? You can point at yourself and say, I Sean, I tired, I hungry, uh, and they're not really that necessary for communication. It kind of sounds like caveman talk, but you could leave them out, those relational processes. You know, the most common one is B, right? I am tired. You can say, I tired, I'm hungry, I hungry, right? If you really want to sound like a caveman, you'd probably say me hungry, because they're not very good at pronouns, right? Uh, but anyway, so that's what the the experiential metafunction does. It gives us a tool for talking about what language means. Now there are six, only six, right? You already see three of these processes here. There are six. And what this allows us to do is instead of just making up our own words each time, like say the first one, I felt the wood. Someone might say that felt there is a, is a physical verb and someone might say it's an action word and someone might say that it's a doing word Right. And so if you're calling it a doing word and she's calling it an action word and he's calling it a physical word. Well, are we always sure that what we're talking about is the same thing? So with the experiential metafunction, we just agree that we have these six words that we use that can be used to describe all verbs. Right. And so material, mental and relational are three of them. And when you have all six, you can then look at any verb. And especially when it's one like this, where it has multiple possible meanings. It allows you to quickly distinguish, to say to someone, 
felt as a relational process, felt as a mental process, felt as a material process, right? It immediately makes that clear which use you're talking about. You can see why it's called the experiential metafunction. It describes, it allows you to describe that experience of felt, of feeling, but in the past tense, that experience of felt in the past tense. And it happens a lot, right? Uh, as you see in front of you, have here, right? Have an answer, have a child, have a cold, have a phone, right? Think about those for a minute. They don't mean the same thing. Have an answer. It's in your head, right? Have a child could be both to, to give birth, right? She had a child recently. She gave birth. Or you can say, I have a child, meaning I, you know, a child in my family, right? Having a cold and having a phone are both kind of possessing them, but they're quite different, right? Having a cold is temporary. Uh, it's not necessarily want something you want to have. Um, you don't see it like you can see the having a phone, right? You can see the effects of having a cold, perhaps a runny nose or what have you, but it's not a physical possession in the same way that having a phone is, right? This happens a lot, right? Especially with these very uh, lexically loose verbs like have and do and make, uh, get, right? I mean, think of any of those, you know, get, get out, get back, do you get it? Let me get that for you. You know, where they, they mean, they can be used to mean a whole bunch of different things. Using the, the experiential metafunction allows us to talk with precision about what it means at this time. Turn again here, right? Uh, many examples. So these are verbs, right? But as I said, we call them, when we're talking about the experiential metafunction, we call them processes. Why not just call them verbs? It is a verb, right? Feel, turn, have, these are verbs, no argument. When we're talking about them as experiences, as what they mean, we call them processes just to remind us of that, that just like you could talk about me from different points of view, if you're talking about me as a, as a, as a family member, I'd be described as a husband or a father. If you're talking about me in terms of work, I'd be called a lecturer. If you're talking about me in terms of nationality, I'd be called Canadian, right? Different, when you want to discuss different aspects of me, you describe me in a different way, but they're all correct. When we want to talk about the meaning of these words that in other cases are called verbs, we call them processes. And in a way, you can think of that as being simple because that means that when you're just talking about them as processes, the grammar doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's active or passive. It doesn't matter if it's present or past. It doesn't matter if it's a, a main verb or an auxiliary verb, that the aspect, progressive or, or perfect, whatever, none of that matters, right? All that matters is what does this word mean at this time in this particular clause? That's what matters when we're talking about the experiential metafunction. The focus, as it says here, is on meaning, not on grammar, right? So you don't need to worry about all of these examples here. Uh, go is present and went is past and are going is progressive, right? And they're getting longer and longer with more and more words. That doesn't matter, right? If you're talking about these as a process, all that matters is what does it mean, whether it's one word or two or four words in the case of number four there. All that matters is what does it mean. Uh, just to make that even more clear, because sometimes people start focusing on that, right? Here's the full, if you're talking about grammar, here's the full layout of options for walk, right? It can be present or past, walked, walked, and you can be doing it uh, for a certain amount of time, am walking, was walking, and so on through all of the different possibilities, perfect, perfect, continuous. None of them matter. All that matters is if you say, I'm walking down the street, you're taught, or, or I walked down the street, or I have been walking for five minutes, or I had been walking for five minutes before I met you, any of those, all that matters is there you're talking about walk, the physical action of moving your feet, that would be a material process, right? Walk in other cases might not be, right? Someone might say, I don't understand. I, I don't understand. Can you walk me through it? Well, there they're not asking you to take them for a walk, right? They're asking you to do something else. You'd describe it as a different process. So all that matters is the meaning. 
So what do you do to do an experiential analysis, right? To look at some individual clause or a text, you start by looking at the verbs, thinking about what kind of process they describe, right? Physical, mental, something else. And then looking at the six possibilities, which we're coming to, right? Looking at the six possibilities and saying which one lines up with what does this word, this process line up with? What does that process line up with, right? Are these and what you'll find that sometimes you'll have a range because that's what happens, right? You'll have some that are mental and some that are material and so on, right? Other times, as we'll see later, you'll find that certain types of text will have certain types of process more commonly, right? That you're using language for certain purposes, you're more likely to use certain types of process. That's where things get a little more interesting Rather than just looking at one sentence, you're looking at a whole bunch of sentences and saying, what kind of pattern do we see here? We'll come to that. So, you were looking at these. She can see better. Number two, I could see your point. Number three, the doctor will see you. And you'd say that, oh, yeah, these seem different, right? The first one feels like, you know, seeing with your eyes. But number two uh, seems like some sort of mental seeing, right? Understanding. And number three, the doctor will see you. Well, you know that when you go into the doctor's office, she or he will see you with her or his eyes. But you know, it means more than that. You're not going to the doc. You know, here it means something like at 3 p.m. The doctor will meet with you and evaluate your health, right? So it means more than that. So what you start by doing is thinking about the meaning of see in each of these cases and then thinking which process best describes the action there. So what are the processes? Let's look at them, right? You've already seen a few of them. <coughs> material, a material process, like shaving, right, is probably what you were first introduced to verbs as, right? Uh, words that tell us about doing things, running, jumping, um, playing the piano, uh, uh, flying through the air as a bird, and so on, right? Material processes are those classic verbs of doing things. Mental processes, things that are happening in our head, right? They're called mental processes. We're doing something in our head. It also includes, mental processes also include what you might think of as something separate, emotional processes, right? Feeling angry is a mental process, right? These are things where something's happening inside you or inside whoever's doing that action, uh, but we can't see it, right? You, if, if I say, uh, I'm feeling happy, you don't know that. I'm feeling sad, you don't know that. I mean, yes, you may know because you see my face that I look like I'm happy, but you can't actually see the feeling. You can see the smile, uh, but if, so if you say I'm smiling, that's a material process, physical action, right, to smile. I'm feeling happy, Feeling is a mental process. So you want to separate the uh, effect in that case, the happiness that makes me smile, from the first thing, the feeling happy, which would be a mental process. Uh, uh, I'm waiting, you know, you see someone standing. What are you doing? I'm waiting, right? I'm waiting for him. Uh, you see the person standing there by the wall, which is a mental process. If they're sort of leaning on the wall, I'm waiting. Well, you see something happening, the physical action of standing by the wall, but the person sitting there waiting, that's something different, isn't it, right? That's a mental thing that's going on. Choosing to stand still and not do anything while you wait is a mental, is a mental process, right? So you really want to think carefully about that when you talk, especially I find it happens with mental processes. Are you talking about the action that's happening internally, the waiting, the thinking, or are you talking about what you see, which is something different, right? The leaning on the wall or the reading a book while waiting. Well, the reading is one kind of process, but the waiting is a different kind of process. So separate them out in order to describe them accurately. <clears throat> Relational process is the other one you saw. Pretty much all the time, a relational process can just be replaced by the word be or am, are, was and so on, right? Uh, so if you say, I am hungry, am is a relational process. The am there just joins I with hungry, as I said earlier. 
think about the earlier example, I feel, whatever it said, I feel sad. I am sad. I feel sad. Pretty much the same thing, right? So I feel sad would be a relational process. A few sides, sides back, there was a, I went over, I didn't say it at the time, but it said the weather has turned nasty. Compare, you know, you're driving a car, uh, turn left at the next corner, turn left at the next corner. That turn left is a material process, right? You're actually going to turn the wheel to the left and the car will physically go left, right? Whereas when you say the weather has turned nasty, what are you saying? You're saying the weather has become nasty. Uh, the weather was nasty, now the, or sorry, the weather was nice, now the weather is nasty. When you say the weather has turned nasty, that's a relational process, right? Weather, nasty. Joined together by the weather is nasty, the weather seems nasty, the weather looks nasty, the weather turned nasty. In all of those cases, those are relational processes that show you that connection with weather and nasty. And that's the kind of thing where, as I said, you know, you do, you hardly even need it, right? If someone says, uh, how's the weather? You can just go nasty. And, and they, you don't need to say the weather is nasty, right? You can just say the nasty and people will know what you're talking about. Other processes that we haven't discussed yet, verbal process, anything to do with singing, talking, shouting, uh, uh, describing, speaking, and so on, right? Verbs that have to do with talk. They are some, they look, you might say, well, isn't that a material process because you're doing something? Uh, yes, uh, you are definitely doing something. You can see my mouth moving. But when this uh, system of six processes was created, uh, largely by uh, my M M A K, he's often known by his initials M A K Halliday, H A L L I D A Y, Michael Halliday. Uh, he decided that it was worth having verbal processes as a separate category for two reasons. First of all, we use a lot of verbal processes. People talk about talk a lot, right? She said this, he said that, she told me this, he argued that, like that, right? So we do it a lot. And because there are quite a few things that we can add on to a verbal process, right? Uh, it's not, it's, there's the who did it, he, what did he do, scream, scream at whom, at the referee, screamed what at the rest of the referee, abuse, Right? We have all these different elements that get added into verbal processes, elements that we're not going to talk about today for the most part, but just there are a lot of them, right? They're very uh, flexible, these verbal processes. They have a lot of possibilities, both in terms of the number of them, screamed, shouted, yelled, sang, uh, whispered, and so on, and the amount of uh, possibilities that, for things that we can use them for, right? Who said what to whom, and so on. Verbal processes. Two more. Both of these two are called minor processes. Not minor because they are less important. Minor because they are less common. Uh, so it's probably best to at least know about the first four and then add on these two later. Behavioral process is, as it says here, and it's sometimes uh, difficult to quite puzzle out exactly which one you should use, because uh, it's often between material and mental. Material, action, physical action, things are happening in the world. Mental, things are happening in the mind or in the emotional uh, affective state, right? It's between that. So think of the difference between see versus watch, right? When you see something, right, it's unconscious. It's with. Uh, it's often used to mean that something happened without you choosing to do it, right? Uh, there's a there's a a crash, and someone says, "Did you see that? Uh, you know, did you happen to see that? Let's say it's a car accident. Did you happen to see that? Right? Did you see that? Like you weren't trying to ha see it, but it happened. Did your eyes happen to take in what happened? Right? See would be a mental process. You don't really know when someone's seeing, right? I mean, their eyes are open, but you don't have to do anything to see, assuming you have vision. You don't have to do anything to see, right? Your eyes just see all the time when they're open. So that see would be a mental process. Whereas watch, right? I was watching television. Watch this. 
what you're doing when you say that, when you say while well, I was watching television, you're talking about being focused, uh, conscious choice to direct your attention at the television, right? When someone says watched this, um, they mean focus your sight on what I'm about to do, right? So that's the best way to think of that. If if you're doing it without thought, without choosing to do so, it's mental. If it's focused, conscious, deliberate, it's behavioral. There aren't many cases of this coming up. See and watch is one major time you can think about your ears uh, and, and think of the other major one is the difference between hear and listen, right? Think about how you use the word hear. Think about how you use the word listen. Which one is mental? Which one is behavioral? In fact, maybe you want to pause for a minute and think about that to see if you can do this yourself. And now that you're back, right, to listen is a behavioral process, right? We use it in the same way that we use watch. We say, listen to this. I've got a great story. You're telling people, focus your listening ability, your ear ability on what I'm about to say. Whereas here, hearing happens, assuming you're a person who can hear, hearing happens all the time without you doing anything about it, right? You hear things without trying, right? Bang, did you hear that? Just like, bang, did you see that, right? So behavioral process. The final one is the, which is another existential process, uh, is as we see here, something like there was a ramp leading down. What's going on here? Uh, notice it's called existential process, which might at first look like it's going to be something uh, kind of, for me at first, when I saw existential process, I thought, oh no, this is going to be difficult. In fact, it's very simple. Existential processes always start with there, and the verb following is always a to be verb or another verb that can be used like to be, such as seem. When you say there was a ramp leading down, all you're saying is a ramp leading down existed, right? When you say, put it in present tense, when you say there's a ramp leading down, you're saying a ramp leading down exists. Whenever you use there at, as a subject and a to be, that's what you're doing, right? Or I can't say whenever, but most, almost all of the time, right? When you say, if someone says, I, I, I need to get home, and you say, there's a bus stop on the corner, you're saying a bus stop on the corner exists. Uh, there's a strange smell in the air. A strange smell exists in the air. Uh, there were three reasons for his anger. Three reasons for his anger existed, right? So that's it. Existential process is there plus be or a very a verb like to be, some other linking verb. And it is used to show that something exists. Uh, and that's the way we do it because, well, you can say a ramp exists in the corner. It just sounds funny. The way we show, there's nothing grammatically wrong with saying a ramp leading down existed. It just kind of sounds funny, right? We've chosen over time to describe that as there was a ramp leading down. Uh, and that's it. So once you know those tools, we can go back to the first slide I showed you and you should now feel comfortable seeing why I described number one as a material process, number two as a mental process, and number three as a relational process. There are six of them, learn them, and you've got a very good tool for describing, for making sense of different meanings of the same word. Uh, let's look at a bit more detail. Here's a material process, right? Found. Uh, she found the ball or the ball was found. Now, if if you think about the meaning of this, they're both pretty much the same, right? Although in the first one, you know who did it. In the second one, you don't, right? What you have here is a bit of additional information that we're going to get into now. Uh, if you look at she and... Uh, no, don't look at she. Look at the ball, right? The ball in both cases, in the first sentence, the ball, if you're talking about grammar, in the first sentence, the ball is the object. If you're talking about uh, grammar, the second sentence, the ball was found, the ball is the subject. But that's grammar. 
when we're talking about the experiential metafunction, we don't care about grammar, we care about the experience that's being described. So in, in grammatical terms, the ball is different in both of these. But if we think of the experience being described, we know that it describes the same thing here, right? That there was, there was some finding happened. That's our material process. That's the same in, in she found the ball and the ball was found. The finding is the same and the what was found is the same. So it doesn't matter that grammatically the ball is after found and in the second one it's before. That doesn't change. The ball is the thing that was found. For a material process, we call the thing that was found the goal. For the material process, whatever it happened to is called the goal. If you say, she kicked him, kicked is a material process, him would be the goal, right? It's too bad for him, but that's, it doesn't always mean that it's a good thing, but that's how it's described, right? That uh, the goal. So, and then as you can see here, the thing that did it is called the actor. The person or the thing that did a material process is called the actor. So here in she found the ball, you have she as an actor, you have found as a material process, and you have the ball is the goal. In that second sentence, which many, many of you may know that that second sentence is called passive voice, right? She found the ball is called active voice. She, the ball was found is called passive voice. What do you see it happens in passive voice here? We don't know who did it, right? That's what often is the case in passive voice. We don't know who did it, who found it, who kicked it, whatever, right? Uh, here, you'll see, right? So it, it, grammar, in this case, when we're using the experiment, experiential metafunction, though, none of that matters, right? So sometimes I think I may be confusing the issue here by using those terms, but I know a lot of you know them. And, and I should emphasize again that they're not wrong. You can call the first sentence active voice. You can call the second sentence passive voice. If you want to talk about grammar, if you want to talk about the experiential metafunction, all that matters is meaning, not the grammar. Now here, see, here we've put in a third sentence. She found the ball. That's actor, that's active voice, as I just said, right? And the actor is the subject that she is the one who did it. So she's the actor, right? The one doing the action. And she's also the subject because she, because of where it appears grammatically. If you look at number two, the ball was found. This is, as I said, it's called passive voice. The actor is, well, we don't even know who the actor is in number two. The ball was found by whom? We don't know. That's passive voice, and we don't know who did it. That's called, as you see, an actorless passive. You can see why it's called that, because we don't know who did it. Actorless, actorless passives are very common. Uh, Sometimes because we don't know who did the thing, right? You might think of a newspaper headline, a man was killed last night. Uh, a man was killed last night by whom? We don't know, right? It's, it's a mystery. Uh, now, let's say that's, let's say there was an arrest made. Uh, it would say, man arrested for murder. By whom? Well, by the police, but there's no need to say by the police because it's obvious, right? So sometimes we use actorless passives when we don't know who did it. A man was murdered by who? I don't know. Uh, or when it, it's obvious who did it. A man was arrested for murder by who? The police. Well, who else would do it? That's who, that's, arresting is done by the police, right? Actorless passive. It's also possible to have, as we see down here in number three, a passive where we do know the actor. The ball was found by her. In this case, the actor is still the same person, right? And in number one, the way that person is described in number one is she. The way that person is described in number three is as by her. In, it doesn't matter. In both of those cases, nothing's changed in experience, right? Nothing's changed in meaning. In both of those cases, she is the actor, by her is the actor, so in experiential metafunction terms, these three sentences are the same, right? They describe the same experience. Number two, it's not quite the same because it's missing a bit of information. In grammatical terms, these sentences are quite different. In terms of experiential metafunction, these sentences are the same. They all have an actor, she, a process, 
finding and a goal ball. What order you put those in doesn't matter in terms of describing the experience. Behavioral processes, as I said earlier, see versus watch, uh, watching TV versus seeing something unexpectedly. Uh, I apologize. This was already here. I talked about this at length earlier when it was here. I probably should have waited. I think that's how I'll leave it because I've already talked about it. Relational processes, as I told you, uh, the verb itself is almost meaningless. Uh, the, the words used to describe the meaningful parts are carrier, as you see, and attribute. A relational process relates a carrier with an, with an attribute. As you can see in all of these, we have the thing we're talking about, which is called the carrier, and we have the thing that's being talked about, the attribute. When you learn another language, you may find, in fact, that it's, if you learn a bunch of words and don't know the processes, it's this case where you can actually make yourself understood without knowing words like has turned or seemed or is or is not, right? You can just sort of point and say, that dog, angry, right? This bread, good. This bread, bad, right? And you don't even need the relational processes. Of course, you have to use them if you want to sound like you speak English properly or whatever other language you're talking about. But they're, they don't contribute a lot to the meaning of the sentence itself. Existential processes, uh, I told you how that works, uh, as you see here in these examples. Uh, I've already been over that. What I'd like to point out is how you can distinguish between there as an existential process and there as a demonstrative reference, right? Sometimes there means that place, right? When you point and say, look over there, look over at that place. Look at sentence number five here. There's a lift there. Which one of those is the one that does the pointing and which one of those is the one that means exists? Uh, well, because you have the earlier sentences here, it's pretty obvious and because I've color coded it for you. But one interesting thing to think about is how you pronounce there. Imagine you're speaking reasonably quickly, uh, f informally chatting. How would you say that one? You'd say something like, there's a lift there. There's a lift there. Notice that you can say there's a lift there. The fact that you can use the reduced form, there's, right, there's a lift, tells you that that is the existential there. Uh, it, the fact that you can use the reduced form, there, tells you that it's actually not really that important. It contributes something to the grammar of the sentence. If I say a lift there, it just doesn't sound grammatically accurate, right? We need that subject. But it's not a subject that means anything other than ex something exists. So you can say there's a lift, but when you get to the blue there, you have to say it in the full form, right? It sounds very awkward to say there's a lift there. Uh, at least it may be some varieties of English, but not in mine, right? If I say there's a lift there, it sounds natural. If I say there's a lift there, it doesn't sound right at all. The fact that I have to say there for the blue one tells you that's a word that means something. It gives the location, right? It, it, it's not just a, a, a grammar word. So that's how you can distinguish between theirs as existential processes uh, and theirs as uh, pointing words, as demonstrative references. So when I use words like carrier and attribute or actor and goal, those words are called participants, right? When I said uh, uh, she found the ball, I said she is an actor and ball is a goal. She and ball are participants. These are the things that, well, you of course she is a pronoun and the ball is a noun or a noun phrase, right? Of course. And again, that's grammar and that's useful. But when we talk about meaning, we don't care about the fact that it's a pronoun or a noun. We don't care about the fact that it's a subject or an object. All we care about is, as it says here, who or what is doing it and to whom or to what is it being done. 
And then we have a list of words to describe those as well. Just like we have the list of words the six to describe the six processes, we have words to describe the participants. She sang, she sang a song, she sang a song poorly. Uh, the participants here, the, the, to be clear, sang is the process, right? It's a verbal process. The participants are she and song. These are the, the two things that you need to, well, you don't need song even, right? You just need she, she sang. She participates in the singing. Uh, who is doing it, as it said on the previous slide? The song is another participant to whom or what is it being done. The singing is being done to the song. Things like poorly, she sang a song poorly. Poorly you don't need, right? That's a bit of extra information that could be added in that tells you about the singing, but it's not a participant because it, if you say who's doing it, poorly's not doing it, to who is it being done, to the song, not to poorly. Poorly is something else which is called a circumstance and which you'll see on a slide later, I'm going to say we don't care about circumstances today, right? So what we want is just to say who or what is doing something to whom or what, and that's all that we care about for today, the participants and the processes. Uh, so there's a few more examples, right? Um, as with processes, we can use the idea of participants to distinguish meaning. Now, this is where people sometimes get a little bit, uh, aren't quite sure if this is true or not, right? If I say, what are the different meanings of I? And they say, well, I always means the person talking. Right, that's true. If I say I am walking, or if I say I'm thinking, or if I say I am Sean, that I refers to me, right? In, in grammatical terms, that's a, a personal pronoun or a personal reference in, in functional grammar terms. That I refers to me. Yes. But think about it in terms of experience, in terms of action, in terms of what's happening in the world. Is the I in number one doing the same thing as the I in number two? Is it I in number two doing the same thing as the I in number three? Here's where the experiential metafunction says no, right? In grammatical terms, the I is the same in all of those cases. It's a first person pronoun, a first person personal reference. Uh, it's, it's singular, not plural, right? All, all of, you could talk about grammar and it's the same. But if you talk about meaning, I hope you can see that it means something different, right? Uh, the I in I am walking, that I is doing something. If you looked at that I, you would see him, me, moving down the street, right? If you looked at the I in I am thinking, you wouldn't be able to see any action. And for me as being that person, uh, I would know I'm doing it, right? I mean, when I'm thinking, I'm aware of the fact that I'm thinking uh, consciously, unconsciously. I don't, I'm not going to get into that, right? But thinking is something that I do, right? Walking is something I do, but it's physical. Thinking is something I do, but it's internal, it's mental. I am Sean. The I and I am Sean isn't doing anything right? I'm always Sean, whether I'm awake, whether I'm asleep. Uh, it's essential to me is being Sean. So in, in experiential metafunction terms, that, that I describes a different thing, right? The I in I am Sean is an actor. The I in I am thinking is a sensor. The I in I am Sean is a carrier. It's always a case where you follow the pattern that if you start with the process, if you decide the process is material, a doing verb, if you decide the process is material, your only options are actor and goal. Who's doing it to whom? Uh, if you decide that the process is mental, like the case of I am thinking, then your only options are sensor and phenomenon. The who's doing the thinking or feeling and thinking or feeling what, right? So sensor phenomenon, you can't mix and match. You can't, if it's a, if, if you decide that walking is an action verb, a material process, you can't then have a sensor. 
It doesn't work that way, right? It's more simple than that. If it's a material process, you have actors and goals. If it's a mental process, you have sensors and phenomenon. If it's a, as number three there, I am Sean, if it's a, you should know by now what that is, a relational process. If it's a relational process, well, you already saw the answer to this earlier. You have carriers and attributes, right? I is the carrier, Sean is the attribute. So each of these processes has two optional, sorry, two options for phenomena, for, sorry, each of these processes has two options for participants. You can, uh, you've heard me describe some of them now, and uh, you can find the participants for behavioral processes and for uh, relational, sorry, for ex existential processes in the description of this video, but I'm not going to talk about them now because those are the minor processes that you don't see as much but it's there in the description. Circumstances. You can pause here and read about circumstances. Extra information. Uh, there's a full description of circumstances in books on functional grammar, such as the one recommended at the end of this presentation uh, and others, but you don't need to know it for today, right? I'm not going into that much detail. You can ignore them. So, Processes, participants, circumstances, right? You've got a text like this, and you could pause and stomp to read it if you want. But uh, what I'm going to do is immediately move forward. So pause now if you want. And you'd end up with something like this, right? Uh, I've, I've Joan followed Alice. Joan and Alice are participants. Followed is a process. And you could go through and try to name these, right? And you would say that Joan here is an actor and followed as a material process and Alice is a goal. And then with the look of someone, now I put who feels that everything has not been said, I put that in square brackets. It wasn't here. I put it in square brackets just to say that's a, that's a, a, a relative clause. We're going to leave that aside and just look at main clauses, right? And so if you look here, you'll see uh, that the processes are the, in red and these are the things that are happening and the participants are in blue and these are the things that are doing or being done too, right? And there's quite a few of them there and there's a mix as you'd expect in a story, right? Someone's telling a story, people are talking, people are feeling, people are thinking. Uh, so we see a mix of process types. What's interesting is when we look at more specific genres and we see common processes to that particular type, right? If you look at this uh, quick start guide for this camera, look at the verbs, insert, insert, attach, set, 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 focus, take. Look at all those verbs. What kind of process are those, right? Are those mental, material, behavioral, etc.? I think pretty quickly you'll see those are all material processes. Those are all doing verbs, right? Insert is a material process. Attach is a material process. Aha. This is a list of instructions on how to do something. What do you see in a list of instructions? A bunch of material processes put in imperative verb form, right? Uh, you know that, you know these are instructions because of one, two, three, right? And because it says quick start guide, uh, that gives you a clue, right? But then what if it was a list of, what if it was a poem there? You'd say that it says quick start guide and Sean, you told me it's instructions, but I can see clearly it's a poem, right? How do you know, how can you prove that it's a list of instructions? Well, you've seen lists of instructions before and what do they have? Imperative verbs that are realized, imperative verbs that appear as material processes. Do this, do that, right? Uh, chop the chicken, stir the vegetables, add the sauce, right? Would be how you'd see it for a recipe, right? Uh, uh, go down the street, turn left, walk to the end of the road, that sort of thing. Instructions, right? Instructions are material processes. So sometimes, unlike in the previous example where you're telling a story and a whole bunch of things are happening, in some genres of text, 
this genre being instructions, we see specific process types. Uh, as I said, all, all experiential, all material processes as far as the experiential metafunction goes. Those other metafunctions there, you can look at those in my other videos if you want to know more about that. Uh, let's look at one more example. Here's a lecture on schizophrenia that I saw. Now here we have look through and look for the processes, right? And, and maybe again you want to pause, look at the processes and think about what process types do we see here most commonly. Now this I'll stop. And you're back and probably you'd realize now that, right, what we have here now, it says a schizophrenia lecture, but you probably quickly realize that this is the start of the lecture, right? And what's one way that you realize that that's the start of the lecture? Well, what do people commonly do at the start of a lecture? Summarize what happened before. And as this person says in our last section, and then the person uses words like talked and called and begin talking and talk called, right? What do we have here? A lot of verbal processes. This is a person talking about talking, right? The person is talking about talking. Well, that makes sense at this point in the lecture. The person is talking about what was talked about in the previous lecture. So we see a whole bunch of verbal processes. Watch what happens as the person then begins the new lecture. Here's the next paragraph in this lecture, the next thing the person said. Pause here and look at what happens in this paragraph, written paragraph. If you're talking, you probably wouldn't call it a paragraph, right? This section of the lecture. Now that the introduction is finished, what happens here to the processes? Pause and look at them and try to identify them. Good, and now you're back. And what, what you should have noticed is that we've got a lot of processes here, I've highlighted them for you in red, that are relational processes, right? Uh, consists, is, occurs, are. Think about how most of these could be replaced by the verb to be, right? Or it would have to change the tense, but look, first of all, Schizophrenia probably is more than one general disorder. However, it is the most devastating disorder that we have. It is about in 1% of the population. I'll skip to the next sentence. However, the cost for care of individuals with schizophrenia is more than $300 billion annually. Uh, uh, look at the last sentence. As a result of the symptoms, they usually are homeless, become homeless, are homeless, right? Almost all of those uh, are relational processes. Stop is the only one that isn't. Stop there is a material process, right? Someone's doing something and they stop it. They've changed, they've done an action, right? So most of these are relational processes. Think about, yeah, that makes sense for a lecture. You have a carrier, the thing you're talking about, which in this case is schizophrenia, and then you list some attributes. You say some things about it. Schizophrenia is a more than one disorder. Schizophrenia is very common in the population, more than 1%. Schizophrenia is expensive to treat. Schizophrenia is a cause of homelessness, right? Uh, that's what a lecture is often, right? The first paragraph was not the first, but the first paragraph wasn't really the lecture about the topic. The first paragraph was explaining what happened before. This paragraph switches to becoming a lecture. Now, if I asked people how they know that the first paragraph was an introduction and that this paragraph is the new topic, they'd probably focus on words like it said last time we talked about, and now here it says first of all. They'd probably focus on words like that, which is fine. Those do help you see the shift from the introduction to the new topic. But what you should now realize, and what you would realize, of course, intuitively, but maybe you didn't have the words to describe it, is that the choice of process changed as well, right? We went from using those talking verb, talking processes, they are verbs, from using those verbal processes to now using a bunch of relational processes. 
So the experiential metafunction allows us to describe that, right? To describe that shift in focus from introduction to new topic. And that's why it's useful, right? That's why it's useful for describing types of language, uh, the difference between a novel and between a lecture and between a camera quick start guide or any other form of instructions. Here I've turned all of those to is for you, except for stop. I've turned all the rest of them to, de to, to be verbs. So you can see how really these are just relational processes. So that's what I wanted to tell you today, right? That there are six process types and each process type has some associated participants. You can see the process types and the associated participants in the description for this video. Thank you very much. Bye.